How can we bring oysters back? Part 3. Oyster Restoration Challenges and Successes Restoring oysters is not as simple as adding oysters back to the water. There are many groups that have different goals for oyster restoration. Some groups want a fishery to stimulate the economy and create jobs, but others want the oysters to be put in protected areas and left to their natural state. These groups must cooperate with lawmakers and funding agencies to achieve these goals, and these groups often have their own goals. Public support is also key to enhancing these programs that rely on taxpayer dollars, and many groups make public interest and education a priority. Funding is needed to establish programs to cultivate oysters and distribute them to restoration sites. And once planted, oysters face natural threats to survival such as sedimentation and disease. And years of prior harvest and sedimentation has left little suitable substrate for planting, and it can be difficult to find cost-effective materials to replace bottom substrate. Finally, human threats cannot be ignored, as theft of restored oysters and sites set aside for protection can be detrimental to these efforts and result in a lot of wasted money. In Maryland, many different groups are involved in oyster restoration. These range from state and government agencies, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, interest groups, and local communities. In Virginia, however, restoration is organized a bit differently. In this part of our presentation, we will focus mainly on the Maryland-based programs which center on the efforts of the University of Maryland's Horn Point Lab Oyster Hatchery and the Oyster Recovery Partnership. A very basic philosophy of oyster restoration brought forth from the Maryland Oyster Roundtable is to maximize both the economic and ecological benefits of oysters. But it's important to note that not all restoration sites have the same goals. Many times it's based on the requirements of the funding agency supporting them, an oyster restoration involves a combination of aquaculture efforts, setting aside sanctuaries for no-take zones, and effectively managing sites for harvest. Strategies are constantly being adapted as technology improves restoration methods. Here we focus on three tenets of oyster restoration in Maryland. This includes hatchery production and planting of oysters, creating harvest reserves and sanctuaries, and partnering with non-governmental organizations and community groups to make everything happen. Restoration starts with hatchery production. The state-of-the-art hatchery facility at the University of Maryland's Horn Point Laboratory produces the young oysters, called seed, which are used to jumpstart the restoration plantings. So let's take a look at how they read their oysters from start to finish. The process includes conditioning adult oysters to make their gametes ripe, spawning oysters to fertilize the larvae, rearing larvae in tanks, and allowing the larger larvae, petty villagers, to attach to the shell and grow as spat. Adult oysters are brought into the hatchery in winter conditions, which is typically sometime in January. Conditioning tanks help control the state of ripeness in an oyster by carefully controlling the temperature of the water. By using them, oysters can be ripened earlier in the season than normal, which allows for earlier production of larvae and spat. Also, the hatchery can delay gonadal development in a similar fashion, which can extend the spawning season later in the year than normal. Both of these allow the hatchery to produce seed oysters over a longer production season than if they rely totally on naturally ripened broodstock. Spawning is a process where male and female oysters release eggs and sperm. Oysters fertilize gametes externally, and in nature they usually do this as a response to a temperature cue. The hatchery can trick oysters into spawning before they would do it naturally by placing them in warm water. After the oysters spawn, gametes are collected into buckets and fertilized. Although the hatchery is capable of spawning any time of the year, this process usually occurs from March to October when the waters are warmest and food availability is high. This enables the spat to go out into the river when the chances for survival are the best. After a successful fertilization of eggs, the larvae, see on the top left, which can freely swim, are placed into growing tanks. These tanks are 12 by 12 feet and can hold 10,000 gallons of water. In 2011, the hatchery produced 3 billion larvae. Rearing this many baby oysters is hard work. Tanks have to be drained every other day to ensure that fecal matter doesn't build up, and they need to be fed a diet of algae that provides the best combination of nutrients to grow fast and that would be similar to what they would eat in the wild. Feeding 3 billion mouths requires a separate greenhouse just to grow the food. At the end of the larval period, usually after a week or two in the hatchery, Larvae undergo a metamorphosis, changing from a free-swimming larvae to one that is attached to some form of substrate. We can identify this transformation when the larva develops an eye spot, seen in the image on the right. 
Larvae ready to settle are then placed into settling tanks. These tanks are outside the hatchery and contain containers of colch, or material for them to attach to, which is usually a clean oyster shell. The larvae are carefully poured into these tanks and allowed to settle. Temperature is carefully monitored in these tanks through immersion heaters, and after a few days the shells are inspected to ensure that they have set as spat on shell, as seen in the top left. After a successful settlement, water is pumped continuously through these tanks from the Chop Tank River. Newly settled spat are very fragile and need a few days to complete growing and hardening before transporting them from the tank to either a nursery area or for final deployment on a reef. Spat on shell can be deployed in several ways. Containers of spat on shell can be loaded directly from tanks into the Robert E. Lee for deployment on reefs. This planning vessel is operated by the Oyster Recovery Partnership and will sail to the deployment site and dump the shell overboard from the deck. This can also be accomplished via a fire hose from a barge. Some takes that aren't quite ready to be planted go to a nursery area. These containers are placed directly into the river until they grow to reach a predetermined size. This can free up tanks for more spat settlement. After planting, the success of the oysters at each site needs to be monitored. The painter lab at the University of Maryland plays a large role in this monitoring. Through scuba diving, water quality monitoring instruments, sedimentation monitoring, and fish and community surveys, the painter lab is able to document the progress and growth of oysters at restored reefs. This is important in recording which areas have the best survival and should receive more plantings. A major limitation to oyster restoration is the available oyster shell to use as substrate. A lot of shell on old oyster grounds is inaccessible either due to burial and sediment or it has dissolved. Shell recycling programs, such as the Shell Recycling Alliance started by the Oyster Recovery Partnership, or ORP, allows restaurants to donate used shells. These oysters, many of which were farmed, can then help provide substrate for restoration. Many well-known restaurants participate, and by doing so, they spread the word to restaurant goers and oyster lovers about oyster restoration. Over 20 restaurants in Washington, D.C. participate in this program. As extensive as this program is, these shell additions only represent a small amount of shell stock that is used for restoration. However, a restaurant like the Old Ebbet Grill in Washington, D.C. can provide shell for as much as 600,000 baby oysters. A single shell that is recycled can provide habitat for 10 oysters. There have been alternatives proposed for oyster substrate, but this has been met with some controversy. Although many of these substrates may be more readily available than oyster shell, they can cost more and are not all natural substrates like shell. Reef balls are another alternative where concrete balls are made with the help of volunteers and then they're put into the water and the spat can settle onto the balls. Being large and heavy, they deter poaching, but they also can interfere with trot lining for crabs. Planting shell in sanctuaries or managed reserves is the target of restoration efforts in Maryland. Although the locations and purposes of each reserve depends on the outcomes of legislation and funding, Sanctuaries are productive areas of oyster bars that act like a Yellowstone Park for oyster reefs, promoting biodiversity. The sanctuary program was expanded in 2010 by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources to include restoration sites. On the other hand, maintenance reserves are areas that are seeded with oysters, closed for a few years to promote growth, and then reopened for managed harvesting as long as the oysters are doing well. Then after a few years, they are closed again so the population can recover. Maryland's efforts this year are focused on planning to restore the Harris Creek Tributary as a sanctuary. A network of sanctuaries and managed reserves may be the future of sustainable oyster populations in the Chesapeake Bay, but their operation continues to be limited by shell and funding. The location of sanctuaries can impact some watermen more than others. As Ben Parks explains, The biggest part of the sanctuaries are on hand tom bottom, and it pretty much did away with a industry that does the least damage to the bottom you know it's the hand tongue he's working with a pair of sticks like the indians did and it the sanctuary has really hurt them you know but it's we're looking at a small handful of people small group of people but they still paid her 300 dollars surcharge and finally community involvement is essential to restoration Volunteers are recruited for various projects such as sorting shell into bag, transporting shell bags, and spreading spat on shell at sites.
This hands-on approach educates the public about the importance of oysters and gives people a chance to contribute to restoring the bay. From businesses to clubs and organizations to individual families, many groups have been involved in restoration efforts. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation estimated over 20,000 volunteer hours from its oyster restoration programs in 2011. One community program with a lot of support is the oyster gardening programs with both the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the DNR's Marylanders Grow Oysters. Oysters are provided by the Horn Point Lab Hatchery, bags are assembled by the volunteers, and this program allows businesses, schools, or homeowners with waterfront properties to grow out oysters over the winter that can be added to the reefs in the summer. Although it may only be a small contribution, with less than 1% of the hatchery's efforts going to this program, its biggest contribution is that it allows the public to become attached to oysters and have a direct contribution to restoration. This is crucial for support of these programs. Furthermore, education and outreach efforts are fundamental to the long-term goals of oyster restoration. From educational displays at schools and festivals, to providing tours of the hatchery, to educating stakeholders like this group from Capitol Hill, these efforts educate citizens and create important partnerships. Another example of this is this outing from 2010 with Booz Allen and the Oyster Recovery Partnership. In summary, this figure from ORP helps visualize the impact of restoration activities in Maryland. Since 2000, over 4 billion oysters have been planted on 70 reefs, covering 1,500 acres. 2012 has been a record year, with 880 million baby oysters planted, with the majority going to restore Harris Creek. Other programs, such as the Oyster Gardens, have provided an additional 2 million oysters for restoration. Hopefully with proper legislation, continuing partnerships, and the necessary support, these programs can continue to produce reefs, stimulate the economies, and set a good example for oyster restoration programs in other states.